Hello BookTube, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is our, our slow book-by-book, author-by-author pub crawl through my Penguin Classic Ball. Uh, and we are in the ancient world, probably for a good while, probably for the rest of maybe uh, February. We are in the ancient world, the, ancient, the world of ancient Greece and Rome. And today we're dealing with a historian, the historian Appian. This is his volume, The Civil Wars, uh, which was translated and edited by John Carter, who retired from a senior lectureship at Royal Holloway College, University of London in 1992, after a lifetime of teaching, which had been preceded by another lifetime of heroic swashbuckling on Barsoom. <laughs> uh, and Appian was uh, uh, well-to-do. He was a Greek. He was born in Alexandria. He, he rose to social and professional prominence in Alexandria. Uh, he was born probably around AD 90, so he's a 90s kid. <laughs> uh, and he grew up in Alexandria, but he made his, he, he came to prominence in Alexandria, but he, he uh, made his way to Rome, of course, and, and rose to some, to some prominence in Rome as well as, as a, in legal profession, as, as an advocate in the law courts. Um, and like many such people, he achieved, he achieved height and status in Rome, and that gave him leisure time, and he used his leisure time to write, and to write histories. And he had a chance to do that uh, because he, parta he partook of something that we've seen already. We've seen it's carved up a few times um, in your Daily Penguin, and that is this, what Edward Gibbon referred to as the Golden Age in Roman history, which began for him with the Spanish emperors, Hay uh, Trajan and Hadrian, and then moved on to the Antonines. Antonius Pius and, and his successors, a time when Rome was wealthy and at peace internally. <laughs> plenty of, plenty of, uh, of carnage on the, on the border and beyond, but no civil wars, no domestic up upheaval. And what, uh, what pretty closely approximates what an American, for instance, or most people in the developed world would consider uh, personal freedom you were free to write, you were free to research, you were free to publish. There was no, there was no uh, cancerous, vicious, violent, monomaniacal tyrant on the Palatine who would, who would kill you in grotesque and, uh, and Byzantine ways if you wrote something he didn't like. There were no forbidden subjects. So it was, a, it was a boom time and lots and lots of people wrote books on all kinds of subjects and when we got to Appian, I'm very glad that, that John Carter made this edition. I'm very glad that Penguin makes it. Uh, but when you read it in this translation, or even directly in, in for instance, the Low Classical Library edition, you come away with a pretty strong impression, which is that it's happenstance. Once again, as we've seen many times before in your daily Penguin, Happenstance, happenstance governs what we're reading here to an extent that should make anybody skin crawl. And the reason that you, that you uh, will have that forefront in your mind when you're reading Appian on the civil wars that racked the Roman world, so we're talking Marius, we're talking Sulla, we're talking Julius Caesar, we're talking Mark Antony and, and the Triumvirate, we're talking the warfare of Roman against Roman all over the Roman world and beyond. That is Appian's subject. And when you're reading the book, the reason why you will think of happenstance is because although he is amiable, he's not particularly good. <laughs> he's, he is, you get the impression when you're reading him that he is a C or maybe lower B tier writer, a C or maybe B tier historian, and that if you had gone into a bookshop, a, a, a bustling bookshop, let's say in the second year of Antonius Pius's reign, or during the reign of, of the, you know, the later years of, of Hadrian, a, a bookshop that was well stocked, that had attentive uh, slaves to, to show you around where everything was, and who knew the wares, who could talk to you about the books and point out strengths and weaknesses, new editions, new illustrations, that sort of thing. Uh, you get the strong impression when you're reading Appian that if you had been in such a store, you would only have bought his books when you had already bought better books on the same subject. And the, the horrible, the horrible, uh, the pitiless, pitiless ratio that we've been talking about in these videos are, is that 
it's just happenstance that we don't have those better books or the relevant parts from those better books. Uh, Appian had a particular work habit. Uh, today, we would probably refer to him as a hack, and not in a good sense, the bad way, the bad kind of hack, in that he would take an author who was already popular on a subject, who was already well-quoted, lots and lots of editions, lots and lots of reprints, and he would sort of stick with that author and, re and just recount in his own words that author's view of what was going on for a long stretch of time. And then when that author fell off, or wasn't quite as good, maybe shifted subjects or shifted source material, then you get the impression that Appian would then move to another author on the same subject and sort of retell in his own words what they say and, and stitch together a narrative along those lines. You don't get a sense when reading him of a very powerful original vision. And certainly you don't get the sense of first-rate narrative powers. Instead, you get the sense of a jobbing historian, the type that, uh, that has come in for scorn from some historians in the modern day. For instance, in the most, in the most infamous case, the, the, uh, <laughs> it's a little ambiguous to call him a Nazi historian, but I think, I think it applies in every conceivable sense. The Nazi historian David Irving, uh, years and years and years ago, when he was first coming into the kind of disgrace that now associates with his name, used to make fun of uh, Third Reich historians and say, well, they say, I'm, I'm writing a new book on the Third Reich, but what they mean is, I'm going around the books on my library shelves and copying down bits and pieces from each one of them in order to make one of my own. But I'm not doing any hard original work, nor do I have any very enlightening uh, new original insights into what's going on. I'm just regurgitating what other people have done. He had a lot of scorn for such people. Other historians that I know have been less open about expressing that scorn, but they still feel it. Uh, and Appian is the kind of person that they're thinking about when they, when they, when they bring up that kind of thing. But we don't scorn having his book because it's, it's in many ways the only thing of its kind that happens to survive. And I want to read you, not from Appian, <laughs> he'll thank me in the morning, but from John Carter. I want to read you from something that he says. In his introduction, he has a fantastic introduction to this, he gives a little discussion of Appian's sources. And it's thorough. This is a very good, very thorough scholar, uh, but it's also heartbreaking. And it, it's heartbreaking for what I'm talking about, so I want to read it to you so you get an, a better impression than I can give you. Appian is the only surviving continuous narrative source in, uh, of any quality for the period of 133 to 70 BC. In addition, he seems at intervals in the later books of the Civil Wars, particularly the last, to depend on accounts which differ from those which, that lie behind our other authorities. As a result, the question of his reliability is of considerable interest, and there have been numerous attempts to identify the sources on which he relied. A persistent theory has uh, seen the lost histories of Asinius Pollio as the bedrock of books two through four. Pollio served as an officer under Caesar, was with him at the crossing of the Rubicon, and fought at Pharsalus after managing to escape Curio's disaster in Africa in, in uh, 49, uh, in 49 BC. Uh, it is certain that his history, which began at 60 BC, reached Philippi, and there is no agreement as to whether or not he recorded events after 42 BC. He did. <laughs> he did. And Appian certainly had those in front of him when he was talking about those periods. Octavian's own autobiography covered the year Octavian went, is, was a, a triumvir who went on to rename himself Augustus. So he's, that's the Emperor Augustus that we're talking about, Octavian. Uh, Octavian's own biography covered the years 44 to 24 BC. Messala Corvinus, a Republican who transferred his loyalty to Antonius, that's Mark Antony, uh, and finally to Octavian, becoming consul in 31 BC, wrote an account of the 30s BC, which is likely to lie behind portions of Book 5 of Appian. Livy himself lived through these years, but this part of his history has not survived, and it is not apparent to what extent, if any, Appian may have used it. Book one has defied all attempts to saddle it with a single coherent source, but we know much of first-hand evidence that was still available. For example, the speeches of the two Gracchi brothers, the memoirs of Sulla and Rutilius Rufus, and some histories. Some of the details of Plutarch's life of Sulla, presumably drawn from Sulla's own memoirs, reappears in Appian, although we cannot tell whether he had it from Plutarch or not. Now, 
John Carter was not meaning to break your heart with, with that paragraph, but oh my god, doesn't it? <laughs> Listen, in just that brief synopsis, there's plenty more detail you could go into with this author. Tracing the echoes in his, in his work line by line, phrase by phrase, word by word sometimes, is fascinating for trying to piece out who he had in mind when he was, when he was writing his work, who he'd read in order to adduce his own account. But even in that brief paragraph, look at all the stuff that we don't have anymore, the relevant parts of Livy, the entire shelf of Asinius Pollio. And Asinius Pollio, the historian, also wrote an autobiography. Appian wrote an autobiography that we don't have. <laughs> Sulla wrote his autobiography at great length, and it was scandalous and popular. So it's not a question of these things being obscure. They, like, for instance, that maybe Propertius or even maybe Catullus might have been a little too obscure. It might not have crossed anybody's mind to make copious copies of poetry, uh, song ditties. But histories? Autobiographies? Uh, Sala ruled the Roman world. There were many, many, many copies over many decades. And they don't survive. <laughs> they, they, all of that stuff does not survive. If you had said, if you had gone back to, to uh, uh, A.D. 160, to a bookshop owner in A.D. 160, and, and told him, I am from 2,000 years in the future, and 2,000 years in the future, we have Appian's book, but we have nothing by Asinius Polio. The bookseller would have thought, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You've come back in time 2,000 years, but unfortunately for me, you're an idiot. <laughs> so send me back a bookish person who will know what they're talking about. But no, a classicist, John Carter himself, who's well accustomed to traveling between worlds, uh, would, could go back to that world and break the bad news to that bookseller the same as anybody else. It's happenstance what we have and don't have. So we have a huge chunk from a second-rate historian. When we would give anything, I know it's it's heresy. <laughs> I I won't it won't impute it to other fans of classical literature. But this particular fan of classical literature, I would give Appian in a heartbeat, even for the small chunks of Livy that we don't have. <laughs> I'd give all of him in a heartbeat for the Livy that we don't have. I'd give all of him in a heartbeat for the Asinius Polio or for the autobiography of Sulla. And that's Rutilius Rufus was a fantastic writer, <laughs> literate, sharp, unconventional. Imagine having not only his autobiography but all of his letters. <sighs> The historians of the day, in the comparative sunshine and tranquility of the Antonines, knew perfectly well what the reading public wanted to read about. Now that they were safe and comfortable, now that they were fat and, cut and safe in their own homes, they wanted to read about civil unrest. There were tons of books on the subject, which makes it all the more frustrating that we don't have as many of them as we would like. So the, your Penguin for today is not a recommend. Penguin Classics makes this. I don't know if they make Appian anymore. They probably don't. But... Uh, I'm glad that they do. I'm glad that there was an accessible paperback of this, but it is for Roman civil wars, Marius, Sulla, Caesar, Mark Antony, Lepidus. It's for, it's for the wonk on that period. If that is your period, if you've decided Roman against Roman for that horrible hundred years, if that's what you want to concentrate on for Roman history, then you have to have Appian and you have to know him really well. What he says, and also all of that stuff that uh, John Carter was writing about, why he says it, and who he's drawing on. You have to know all of that, because this is the bedrock of how we know anything about the period, a lot of it. Uh, so that's, that's your Penguin for today, an author many of you will not have heard about, uh, to, to sort of counterbalance all the marquee names that we've been getting on your Daily Penguin. But don't you worry. The marquee names are coming back. <laughs> we can't do without them. They are my oldest friends. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now, but we'll be back tomorrow for more. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.